Before I can talk about the rest of Broken, I have to talk about why it's such a pivotal episode for me. House was the first TV show that I bought on DVD, and therefore the first TV show that I binged, and it was life-changing. It was almost sacred. So I didn't watch the series live, except for the final season. I would wait a year and then buy the DVD after the fact. So when I got season 6, Broken blew me away. Even then, I knew the show wasn't going to be able to top it. I love Broken. I think it gave the whole, not just the season, but the whole six years, it gave that a sort of shape and a meaning and uh, a kind of truth. I, I, uh, yes, yeah, a kind of truth. Structurally, Broken is the point of no return. Most TV shows decline because they reach a natural conclusion, but continue past their expiration date. If you finish something, don't just put back the empty box, throw it out. Though, I was surprised to find comments on old 2007 forums complaining about Season 3 and longing for the good old days of the first two seasons. Since I'm on this side of history, and I've thought about this a lot, I'd like to think I have a better perspective. Oh yeah, we've all got perfect 2020 hindsight. I think Broken would have made a great finale, but there's a lot to love afterwards. Some of my favorite moments are in the later seasons, and a lot of follow-up episodes ask really important questions. How does House cope without narcotics? What do you expect? I'm an addict. I turn everything up to 11. Yeah, I thought you were trying to tone that down. No, I was trying to find something I could set at 11 without blowing out my eardrums. Maybe diagnostic medicine is the key to keeping you clean. What happens if nothing makes him happy? If nothing in the world can hold your interest, We'll deal with that when we get to it. But you have to trust me, and you have to be patient. And can he sustain his therapy? So they don't trust you. They assume you'll fail. Are these their fears or yours? Part of the challenge for the writers was figuring out a new direction for House, and by extension, the show. Broken, for all of its complexity, is a sugary sweet episode. House is making efforts to be a better person. I mean, we're very, very aware that how, f how far we're pushing. Right, sort of making House a nice guy. But the premise is not Dr. Nice Guy treats the sick with kindness. If you can't be nice, why be a doctor? He's not allowed to change that much. Season 3 opens with House completely pain-free after treating his leg with a ketamine coma. But if he's not limping, if he's not in pain, is he even really House? What happened? A nice notion to end the season on. He wants ketamine. He wants the physicality. He wants to be able to walk. So that's what we have to look forward to next season. Is he yes. going to walk? Is he going to walk? And yeah, he won't. <laughs> He'll never change. <laughs> yeah. So it wasn't long before he was back to his usual self. New directions can be a fork in the road for people. Fork! <laughs> Very clever. Some fans may prefer House the Icon, the Cain, the Vicodin, the acerbic bastard. Others may prefer House the Human Being, change, growth, happiness, or steps in that direction. An icon can be frustrating because it's the same thing over and over, eventually it becomes impractical. How many times can House interrupt a surgery last minute? Stop. It's Dr. House. Oh, wake him up. We're done. <laughs> have you completely lost your mind? No, but I have been feeling a little sick lately. Aren't you? Oh. House, leave her alone. Close her up. You want to know why? The room's no longer sterile. True. That's not the most interesting reason. That is not a sexy big toe. You never put that in your mouth. Don't touch his eye. This is an appendectomy. Like I said, don't touch his eye. How many times can Cuddy get mad at House when he's right about a diagnosis? You had no right to invade my privacy. There was no medical reason for that whatsoever. And there was certainly no moral reason for it. Oh, damn. You're right. The focal consolidation makes fungal pneumonia far more likely. You're right, I'm right. Cuddy's a tricky character. 
is if we just have her constantly saying no, no, no to how she just looks like an idiot. I have a whole new appreciation for what you do. How hard it is to believe when everyone around you is telling you that you're wrong. On the other hand, change can be frustrating because the series stops resembling what you initially liked about it. Do I want to watch House take responsibility, respect people, and make amends? I do nice things. Nice things happen to me. Karma works. I don't know. It's kind of weird. So when should a series end? Before any big changes or after it's too late? And by too late, I mean Hugh Laurie's bald spot. Is that a hairpiece? You're British and bald? Balding! Balding! He's lovely! So ending the series on a prominent saccharine note would satisfy both. House addresses the roots of his misery, but we don't have to sit through every tedious reparation or possible relapse. Once he changes, the show is over. In real life, that might be convenient, but in storytelling, it's conclusive. So in my opinion, the writers should have stopped here, but did they? Did they? Yeah, that one was rhetorical. Oh. Uh, no, they did not. Since they kept going, they were stuck with a huge storytelling vacuum. So now what? Fundamentally, the building blocks are the same. The actors have fine-tuned their craft. The dialogue is still razor sharp. She's still on the waiting list. And we're gonna do whatever we can to find her another- What? Ginormous crack pipe. Have you people been sucking on? House. And the visuals get more and more ambitious. Get away from me. Calm down. The difference is the longer things go on, the more the showrunners have to compete with themselves. So everything has to be bigger and better than the last, sometimes to the point of absurdity. When I signed on to do a medical drama, I never expected to be shooting guns or dancing on a stripper pole or <laughs> doing a variety of the things that I've done on this show. Tripping used to look like this. Now it looks like this. Taub? Taub is either a Tooth Fairy or Rainbow Bright? Religious people used to look like this. If I break my leg, I believe it happened for a reason. I believe God wanted me to break my leg. I also believe he wants me to put a cast on it. Now they look like this. Eating lunch with a coma patient used to look like this. The man's in a coma. He didn't mind. I asked. You're getting crumbs all over him. Now it looks like this. How did he lift him off the... Whatever. Pranks used to look like this. Now they look like this. Well? And this. You're an ass. And this. A cop chase used to look like this. Now it looks like this. All right, that's pretty cool, but you get my point. The formula creates unrealistic escalations. Subtlety is obsolete. Efficiency is by the numbers. Colder. And experimentation is the craziest thing you've ever seen. Get her out of here, she's got metal in her leg. There's a moment in the first season that I love. It's subtle, but it makes all the difference. 
The team is doing a differential diagnosis, and Cameron naturally forgets the name of a disease. What's it called? It, uh, it's genetic. The body accumulates too much copper. Oh, um, uh, Wilson's disease? Yeah. Very rare. That's such a human thing to do. Although these doctors are extremely intelligent, they are, in fact, people. Even House. I mean, we're all people. We're all people. I like that. It doesn't happen often, but early on, there are efforts to show the team doing research. They have to work towards a solution. Torture coming through all that stuff, ain't it? Real dull. Awful. It's no problem. When House auditions a new team in season four, the candidates are also rough around the edges. Some examples are direct. She's on fire! He's dry enough. Not yet. Dry faster. Ten more seconds. He'll get brain damage. He needs to do arc. Wait. He's, he's dry enough. Clear. You gotta... But others are appreciably subtle. I read that a hydatid cyst could would affect the lungs, not the bladder. But by the last two seasons, three different rookies are immediately perfect diagnostic memory machines. Portal vein thrombosis could be caused by Wilson's disease. Hooray! You pot your cherry, diagnostically speaking. Unfortunately, first time always sucks. There's no time to read or stumble over the illnesses or ease into expertise. We've got to get through this because the show has a familiar rhythm. The biggest victim here is the structure. The last few seasons have their problems, and I'll talk about the specifics later, but almost everything is affected by structural changes. The early seasons, 1, 2, and 3, follow a tight ABC structure. The A story is first and foremost the case, and it presents a clear theme. Love, faith, parentage, whatever it may be. The B story is House and the Team's drama, usually prompted by the case. And the C story is a clinic patient who's also thematically related. It's not always that black and white, but it's a good baseline. Our deluxe package offers all the services of A, B, and C. To give you an example, there's an episode in season one titled Fidelity. And it's not exceptional, but it demonstrates just how tight a structure can be. The A story is about a woman who probably has African sleeping sickness, but there's no way she could have gotten it unless she or her husband had an affair. The other condition is significantly more likely if, if you've had an affair. Have you ever had an affair? I'm not a doctor, so I don't really care if a stranger does or does not have a random disease. But if you frame it so that a disease has a dramatic cost, it's more engaging. We all make mistakes. And we all pay a price. So thematically, marriage is on the table. I love my wife. You certainly love saying it. <laughs> the B story is a personal reaction from Cameron. This is the first time we find out that she married a man dying of cancer. I was 21 and I watched my husband die. I'm sorry. And the C story is about a clinic patient with shortness of breath, who just so happened to get a recent breast enhancement. They were a present for my husband's 40th. I figured he'd enjoy them more than a sweater. That's so sweet. Well, that's what breasts look like. Which feeds right back into the A story. Did you look at her breasts? Man. But it turns out spicing up her marriage was not what her husband was looking for. Wait, are you saying that- That it looks like your husband stirred in some of his blood pressure medication along with brown sugar. You think my husband's trying to poison me? No, nothing like that. He just doesn't want to have sex with you. So every part of the episode is working towards a specific theme. Therefore, the episode as a whole feels intentional and relevant. Should every episode be this tight? No. Sometimes characters have problems regardless of the case. Sometimes a clinic patient is funny just to be funny. I'm sorry, I missed that. Could, could you do that again? That's 
That's very good. <laughs> it's hiccups. But it doesn't take much to thread ideas together. In the episode Airborne, there are two cases, one on the ground and one in the air, and they're completely unrelated, physically and thematically. But structurally, the writer is able to make a comparison. Both patients need a lumbar puncture at the same time, so one establishes the norm, and the other highlights House's makeshift procedure. In the episode Sleeping Dogs Lie, the patient can't sleep. And guess what? Neither can House. <laughs> Simple, but effective. The middle seasons, 4 and 5, are open to more character storylines outside of the hospital. When House auditioned a new team, it created this new inertia, a little bubble that didn't have to conform to the old structure. Actually, the point was to do something different. I think it's a slightly more open show now as the seasons grow. And it was, it was a little bit more procedural medical, I think, in the first few seasons. and now. It's a little bit more about character. I mean, we have almost a whole new team. So the clinic patients have been replaced with extra character moments. The priority was to maximize time to get to know the new applicants. And once things settled down, they never went back. You might get an episode that's as tight as any classic. In the episode Birthmarks, the central theme is adoption. The patient was born in China during the one child policy era and her parents tried to kill her as an infant by pushing needles into her brain. Regardless of that little problem, she's also struggled with being adopted her whole life. People stare at me anytime I'm out with my family. It's like a puzzle. Which one of these things doesn't belong? House goes to his dad's funeral, and he's convinced that his father isn't his father. Turns out, he's right. And Kuttner primarily treats the patient. He's, of course, also adopted. I was adopted by a white family when I was nine. I like being different. The view's better from the outside looking in. Or you might get an episode that juggles a lot of subplots. They can be prompted by the case, thematically similar to the case, but because there are so many characters, one or more of the subplots will be disconnected from the others. In the episode Joy to the World, the patient is a student who's bullied in high school, and at the end we find out she gave birth not that long ago. So there are two thematic umbrellas, bullying and birth. House tricks a husband into believing his wife is going to have a virgin birth, in order to save their marriage, in order to get a gift, in order to win a bet with Wilson. I win. Cuddy is attached to the patient and eventually adopts the child she gave birth to. Kuttner tries to atone for being a bully in high school. And disconnected from the others, Foreman and 13 fight over the ethics of a clinical trial. And at the end, they make up and make out, setting up a future relationship. And I don't think this kind of storytelling is less than. There's a spectrum here, convincing versus entertaining. Season one is a classic, especially when it comes to realistic character studies of House. But I think season five is the peak of what the show is capable of. There's a lot of bang for your buck, especially on rewatch. There's drama, love, and the cases are incredibly theatrical. A cat that predicts people's death. Don't we all have quirks? Aren't those eccentricities what make us human? It's like Debbie's here on Earth to bring people to the other side. The doctors we spoke to also agree that the cat... Our jobs get sick too. A guy who's unable to filter his immediate thoughts. How's Paige? Whoa, I would do her in a minute with fudge and a cherry on top. Would someone please explain to this woman there's only so many apologies I... He has frontal lobe disinhibition and a guy who takes House hostage. I want the best doctor in this hospital here, now, or I'm gonna start killing people. What seems to be the problem? I mean, this is what television was made for. How can you watch that stuff? Because it's awesome. It's preposterous. Not one real moment since I've been on the show. I suppose to shows that represent the world exactly the way it is, like... Can't think of any. Even if you think it's ridiculous, which it is, there's an effort to give it complete focus. 
It doesn't have any subplots and all the time is devoted to this emergency situation. It's actually seven minutes longer than an average episode. Is it pulpy? Over the top? Totally, but it's still cohesive. So if the early seasons are tight classics and the middle seasons are experimental peaks, then how are the later seasons structured? Well, again, a formulaic model eventually becomes unsustainable. By seasons six and seven, the writers had pretty much exhausted every medical possibility. I don't really watch the show for the cases, and I certainly haven't watched the show over 20 times for the cases, but since they take up so much space, it's better when the cases are interesting. What possible relevance does this differential have to your problems? It ends with the diagnosis of spongiform encephalitis. I convinced the team to cut out part of this woman's brain. That's not interesting to you? No. On its own, the what is not interesting. It's the why and the how, the social implications. If you told me a married couple has hereditary angioedema, that means nothing. If you told me they have to be related for both of them to get it, that means something. How can we be related? <sighs> we think you have the same dad. We don't know for sure until we do the test. Oh, God. By the later seasons, it does become a routine checklist of symptoms, diagnoses, and then a random solution. The patients have their personalities, sure, but more often than not, their illnesses are unrelated. A porn star has extra-intestinal Crohn's disease. Great. A woman in an open relationship was stung by a bee. Okay. A blogger has Whipple's disease. I don't know what that is, and even if I did, why should I care? I assume the writers don't care either. Just look at the numbers. House visits fewer patients or families per season. I hate the statistics, not the statistician. Based on their priorities, it's clear to me that they'd rather be hanging out with their characters. For example, in the first two seasons, Wilson is on his third marriage, but we never meet his wife. She doesn't show up at work, or invite House over for dinner, or anything like that. Presumably because it wasn't relevant. You'd rather have dinner with your wife? Yes, I would. If she were speaking to me. Later, Wilson reconnects with his first wife, Sam, and it's a significant arc. The writers get to explore Wilson's relationship and how it affects House. I like my stuff. Hated when Wilson moves in. Oh. Money. This is not about Wilson! But they're still bound to the premise of the series. It's a medical mystery, so the cases either feel like obligations or absolute insanity. And you could say that about the middle seasons, except now the writers are struggling to connect any of their ideas. What does a medical conference have to do with a girl who's obsessed with comics? What does House's green card wedding have to do with a homeless cannibal? What does Wilson buying furniture have to do with a guy who slept with his son's girlfriend? See what I mean? Any of these stories could be impressive, but because they're spinning alone in the atmosphere, they come across as random or underdeveloped. Let's take a look at that crucifixion. The patient's daughter once had cancer, so he promised God he'd crucify himself for every year that she lived. The cancer disappeared, and so far he's on year number four. He believes in a higher power that can affect his life, like most people on the planet. True, on the other hand, crucified himself. And this is what entertainment is all about, explorations of extreme circumstances. Except the crucifixion is just a minor footnote to other unrelated subplots. Instead of exploring religion with our colorful cast, all of our characters are preoccupied with their own personal problems. What's it mean when somebody takes their cell phone into the bathroom and they're taking a shower? Taub thinks his wife is having an affair, nothing to do with religion. Wilson proposes to Sam and she breaks up with him. Nothing to do with religion. House fights with Cuddy about lying. Nothing to do with religion, unless you include a vague Swiss Army phrase like a leap of faith. Maybe it's time I took a leap of faith. 
I'm sorry. I won't lie to you again. You got such a pretty Thank you. Smile. If they don't care about the patient, then why should I? There are so many ways you can make this believable. How about a reaction from the media, which happens to another patient in literally the next episode? When I saw her lying there, I thought, I can't just stand here and let her die. She has her whole life to live. I would expect a crucifixion to be newsworthy. That is not TV. Compelling television. The patient has disciples. That's interesting. What could you learn about them? What could they reveal about House? Where are your friends? Still casting lots for your clothes? All I ask is that they pray for me. It looks like stigmata. Shh. Pious? When House treats a nun in season one, he has a conversation with two of her associates. There's always something wrong, and there's never a reason for it. Mother Superior plays right into it. Let's Augustine off work duties. Treating her as fragile, special. That must make you angry. Becoming a nun doesn't make you a saint. Becoming a doctor doesn't make you a healer. <laughs> and just because we live in a monastery and we spend most of our time in prayer doesn't mean we don't find time for drama. So what is the sick one's drama? And by connecting with the patient, Chase reveals that he was going to be a priest before being a doctor. You told me your favorite passage. Would you like to hear mine? Celebrate and be glad, because your brother was dead and is alive again. The prodigal son. Time, information, and connections paint a picture, and absurd characters need that more than anyone. So seasons six and seven are all over the place. But that's okay, I like hanging out with these characters. For every boring patient, you get speed dating. I'm an oncologist. Oh, my aunt and my grandma, they both died from breast cancer. Do, do you want to talk about it? For every blah diagnosis, you get go-karts. What is her problem? She hates Jews. Never again. And for every disconnected subplot, you get karaoke. I know you will. On the midnight train to Georgia. On the midnight train to Georgia. But coming into season eight, they wrote themselves into a corner. By this point, a lot of the cast left and were introduced to a couple of new characters. I'll talk about that later, but structurally, there's not a lot of room to hang out. It's like if you progressively gained weight and bought bigger clothes to accommodate your size, and then you suddenly lost all of that weight, only to be stuck with oversized clothes. Coma diet. I could make a fortune. So the structure that they had slowly developed of shoving the cases to the wayside and focusing on character didn't really fit anymore. Anything? No adverse effects. And scene. Now we're back to boring reality reality. So season eight is actually a return to form. Over the years, those inside the body animations pretty much disappeared. We were in love with those special effects, and we still are in love with those special effects, but we were putting them in everywhere because they were so cool. Now they're back in almost every episode. Test my urine. The clinic patients are a sight for sore eyes. At first I thought it might be frostbite, but I haven't really been out in the cold. And yet your first thought was frostbite. Yeah, I guess I was just going by how it looks. Looks absolutely nothing like frostbite. The themes are much more connected. You really think it's a coincidence that we're treating a whistleblower and now talking about blowing the whistle on house? And there's an effort to echo dialogue from the pilot. Everybody lies. Why lie about it? Everybody lies. Is he a good man? He's a good doctor. Do you know him? Is he, is he good? Or? He is an excellent doctor. I just want to die with a little dignity. There's no such thing. He just wants to die with a little dignity. There's no such thing. Like a salmon returning to its birthplace. Episodically, it's better than the previous season. But if you compare it to what it's trying to be, it falls short. And the difference is obvious on the off chance that the writers copy themselves. 
An episode in Season 3, titled Finding Judas, is notably similar to an episode in Season 8, titled The C-Word. The C-Word is cancer, by the way. And now we know what C stands for. Uh, oh. A six-year-old gets ill when her dad takes her to the fair. The parents are divorced or separated. The mom is uptight. The dad is loosey-goosey. Halfway through the episode, the dad goes rogue and tries to take her to another hospital. And the emotional core is focused on the fractured family dynamic. Their bickering upsets their daughter. I'm her mother. You can't just... You fight. She has an anxiety attack. Two of you are making her worse. Get out and don't come back. Where was my right when you're treating our daughter like a lab rat? She'd be dead if I hadn't. Stop I mean... it. Your daughter deserves better than this. And the girl wants her parents to get back together. They hate each other, don't they? Never gonna be together again. Do you think my parents will get back together? Cute. When their daughter is saved, the parents won't necessarily get back together, but maybe this experience has put things in perspective. The only novel thing about the C-word is that the girl already has a genetic condition and her mom is a doctor. The similarities don't bother me, but it's a great opportunity to figure out why one episode is engaging and the other is passive. The difference here is meaning. Every patient gets about 20 minutes of screen time and their struggles can be cliched. But if our main cast gets emotionally invested, then we will too. In Finding Judas, Cuddy and Hal step into parental roles, literally and thematically. Cuddy is uptight, House is loosey-goosey. I'm awarding temporary guardianship to a doctor who will place the health of the child above all else. I don't think Dr. House is capable- Dr. Cuddy. Yes, Your Honor. No, I was finishing my sentence. The kid's all yours. For Cuddy, this is a poignant responsibility. She tried to get pregnant through in vitro fertilization, but it never took. Now she's thrust into a maternal situation she's not equipped for. I'm scared. It won't hurt. It takes a while, so it'll be boring, but it won't hurt. And House is dealing with police interference and detoxing, which means he's especially bitter towards Cuddy, the metaphorical mom. House, can you focus on the case? No, because I'm in pain. Because you think that compromise is the answer to everything. I need more pills. And their confrontation climaxes when House takes things too far. Look at her arm. I told you it was an infection. We fixed the infection. Well, apparently not. I asked you for broad spectrum. You put her on the bare minimum. Good thing you failed to become a mom because you suck at it. I've seen House be rude a thousand times, usually to achieve something. I have never seen him be mean just because he can. Seriously? In the C word, as the title suggests, Wilson has cancer, so House doesn't even touch the case. It's unusual in that it's, it's sort of two, it's almost like two short stories just, and they're not really even woven together. They just, uh, they just happen in parallel. They're two separate worlds. Right off the bat, there's a disconnect. If House doesn't care about the patient, then why should I? And the secondary characters don't really care either. They're doing their jobs, business as usual. They talk to the girl about her parents, but that concept doesn't affect them because none of them are parents, except for Taub. My daughters do that too, but they know that sometimes when it seems like mommy and daddy are fighting, it's really only because they're worried about you. But the scene doesn't go anywhere because the episode isn't about Taub. It's a drop in a bucket with a hole in it. It doesn't mean anything. So take a basic story about a dysfunctional family, a story that can easily be cliched, and you can see why one version is better, because it's physically and emotionally structured to make you care. A little girl is scared and in pain. I was awkward, terrified of doing the wrong thing. That's normal. That's. I didn't hug her. I didn't even reach out and hold her hand. I told her it was going to be OK. She needed reassurance. I told her her folks might get back together. 
<laughs> Let's say we take five. Get some coffee. Go pee.